Hi everyone, my name is John T. Amisha here with Optolingo. This is my first attempt at making a little bit of an explainer video to explain who I am, uh, what Optolingo is, why I do what I do, why I think what I do is uh, interesting and unique relative to what other people do and are trying to do in the language space. Um, this is my first time doing a video, so I, I hope it comes out okay. I'm going to apologize in advance if the audio quality or sound quality is a little off. I'm also going to apologize in advance um, because I'll be looking at my notes in front of me. And so if I break eye contact, it's because I'm new at this and referring back to my notes. Um, so Optolingo uses this thing that I call guided immersion. Uh, what is guided immersion? Um, in part, it's a, a phrase that I created just because it's easier than explaining what you're about to listen to. <laughs> uh, but in part, it, it is a methodology that I stumbled across um, that was really a reaction to a lack of learning materials that were available to me as I was attempting to learn my ethnic language, which is called Circassian. So if you've checked out my website or uh, read my blog, uh, you've probably learned by now that I'm an ethnic Circassian. Uh, my mom and dad spoke, speak this language as their first language. Um, but for whatever reason, I was never taught this language. I never picked it up as a child. And so I taught myself how to speak this language as an adult. I'm not going to say that I'm a perfect speaker, but I will say that I often do pass as a native speaker. Um, I'm not going to throw around the word fluent because I just think that's a loaded word. Um, but a normal everyday conversation uh, there are a number of times where I'll reach for a word or a phrase or it just won't come out the right way. But more often than not, in everyday conversation, um, I can get by and nobody would ever think that I, I was not a, uh, speaking this language as a child. So how did I come across this, um, this thing that I call guided immersion? Well, I got to give you a little bit of a backstory. <clears throat> when I first decided, decided that I wanted to learn Circassian, um, what I learned was that there were no materials that were available for a non-native speaker to learn. And what do I mean by that? What, how, why would there be materials for a native speaker? Um, back in the North Caucasus, where there are many uh, ethnic Circassians who speak Circassian in the home, there are books that are produced by the local schools, um, but they assume that you have access to native speakers in your home. They assume that you are familiar with the uh, Russian alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, and uh, have some knowledge of the modifications to the Russian Cyrillic alphabet that are necessary to be able to apply the Cyrillic alphabet to the Circassian language and understand how to read and write and so on and so forth. Uh, it also assumes that the phonetics are uh, known to you, or at least they're known to your parents, and that you can speak the language with your parents at the age of you know six, seven, whenever children go to school. So none of these things uh, were accessible to me, um, because I, at the time, did not read or write anything of the Cyrillic alphabet. And although my parents are fluent uh, in the Circassian language, for a variety of historical reasons I'm not going to get into right now, the vast majority of diaspora Circassians who were born and grew up outside of our, our ethnic homeland are illiterate in the language, um, which is a whole other side uh, issue of why I know for a fact that formal study of grammar is not necessary to speak a foreign language or to speak any language because I have a whole generation of my parents and their parents who never cracked open a book and can speak with perfect diction and without any grammatical issues. That's a whole uh, side story. So what did I do? Um, I, I, I kind of pursued two tracks. One was to gather as many um, materials as I could, and the other was to buy and study every commercial language learning course that I could get my hands on um, outside of anything that I had done in high school or in college or in grad school when it comes to language, you know, foreign language studies or things of that nature. So um, every textbook you can imagine, um, the most common, most popular textbooks sold by Macmillan, uh, whatever it was that I had access to in college and grad school and in, uh, in high school and in grammar school, um, I paid money out of my own pocket to go to training seminars that were taught to UN um, language instructors. I paid money out of my pocket to go to uh, 
uh, accelerated language teaching programs that are designed specifically for people who are going into the Peace Corps. Um, you name it, I tried it. And I tried it across a variety of different languages, even languages I had no desire or ability to speak. Um, for example, I took a course in Greek. Why? Because it's a European language, but it has a different alphabet than most other European languages. Uh, I did it in Arabic, different uh, phonetic system, different grammatical system, different alphabet. Uh, took courses, read books, uh, downloaded apps for Mandarin because there's no um, alphabetic system. It's a, it's a pictorial system, obviously. So put my hands on everything that you could imagine. And um, a couple of close friends of mine are professional teachers, not language teachers per se, but just regular teachers. And the thing that became very clear to me is that, um, and, and this is surprisingly common in lots of fields, there are no or very few um, proven methods that are demonstrably better than other methods that are in use. Um, there are a number of academic approaches to teaching languages, some of which I think are very um, useful, many of which I think are not. There are many um, field work, uh, clinical, you know, clinicians, people who are actually teaching languages. There are many methods that those people use as well, but there's not really much in the way of literature that would compare or contrast one method to another. Um, and there's certainly very little in the way of uh, testing that would go beyond just a standardized test of, you know, fill out these multiple choice questions or, you know, recite these vocabulary terms. So long story short, what I realized is that um, to a high degree, there are no real authentic experts in this space outside of people who just genuinely speak multiple languages. And the methods that are out there are largely ineffective. Um, and I want to be careful about that. You know, if you do anything long enough, it'll work. Um, if you wanted to memorize a dictionary, which I tried, it could work. If you wanted to slam your head against uh, a book that you're not ready to consume because it has advanced grammar and advanced um, vocabulary, that'll work too. Um, but what I was interested in was the efficiency. Um, you know, there's this old adage that I remember from, from grad school. Um, there's there's uh, efficiency and there is um, what is it? efficiency and proficiency. I forget. One is doing things quickly. One is doing the right things. And you want to do both, right? Um, you don't want to be working your way through a 400 page textbook, which is doing the right thing, but not necessarily doing it quickly. Um, likewise, you don't necessarily want to be staring at an app 20 minutes a day where you're doing it quickly, but you're not necessarily absorbing the right things. Not to say that, you know, there's not room for apps. So um, I, I kind of started off with rote memorization. Um, I started off with um, a lot of drilling. Um, you know, memorizing uh, the same sentences, the same phrases over and over and over again. And I, I got to a certain level of proficiency. I'm not going to lie. Looking back at it, I think that the thing that helped me the most to learn Circassian was to teach Circassian. And that, that's a very weird statement because how can I teach a language that I didn't speak very well? The fact, the act rather, of internalizing these concepts and designing lessons that could be taught to others, um, I think that it forced me to internalize the, the concepts, the words, the vocabulary, the phrases, and it actually was the first step towards me developing what, what I now call guided immersion. So when I first started uh, teaching other ethnic Circassians how to speak Circassian, um, I thought, well, I'm going to start with a formal study of the grammar, as best as I've been able to uh, identify what that is. I'll do some basic vocabulary words and I'll have a couple of you know key phrases. Um, and what I found is nobody had time for that. Nobody cared about what the formal structure of the grammar was. Nobody wanted that rigorous academic grounding. What they wanted, what I wanted, was to be able to speak to the elders, was to be able to um, say a few words to a grandmother or a grandfather or understand what a story was um, being told around a, a dinner table full of uh, the elders of the family who were sharing these oral histories that they could not write down <clears throat> because they're illiterate in Circassian. So that really kind of threw me for a spin because, of course, having come through 
you know, looking at all these textbooks and, and other materials that were available, um, what I really realized is that people don't care about grammar. And, and furthermore, in speaking with my, my parents and other people in my community, I realized these people had never actually ever been exposed to formal grammar. Um, they had just been exposed to regular speaking over and over and over again. So about a year or two into my journey, for lack of a better term, I came across a book in Nalchik, which is uh, the capital of uh, Qabardina Baqaria. I don't know how to say it with an American accent, but it's Qabardina Baqaria. That's what we call it. And I found a book uh, called uh, Qabardinsky Razgavornik. And I might have an accent saying that in Russian. It was a Russian book. Uh, but it's a Circassian phrase book or Kabardian. That's the dialect I speak. Uh, phrase book. And I started thumbing through it and I thought, wow, th this is... This is everything I would love to be able to know how to say just to get by. You know, hello, how are you? How's the weather? How do I get here? How do I get there? Uh, when's the next bus? I thought, this is just amazing. So um, copied down, you know, a couple of these phrases and started to try to memorize them, uh, as was my, my uh, modus operandi at the time. And what I realized was that it, it worked, but it was exceptionally time-consuming. And I also realized that it was a little mechanical. So um, over time in forced dialogue with people, I could spit these things out, but I was so anxious about nailing the, um, the phonetics, about getting the pronunciation correct that, um, you know, I, I would just spit these things out and they would not flow naturally. So... I'll bore you with a lot of the detail. Uh, if you're interested, just leave a comment or do something like that, and I'm sure I can I can follow up with it. But what I came to realize is that it's not about um, formal grammar study. What it really is about is being able to express yourself in the most basic of means. Um, doing that through common and useful phrases in conjunction with common and useful um, vocabulary. So where did I go from here? I had this insight, um, but I still didn't really know how to form this into something that would be actionable, tangible, useful um, to anybody who wanted to learn Circassian, let alone myself. So where did I go with this? Um, I spent years, I spent years um, buying every phrase book that I could get my hands on in um, a variety of different languages, Turkish, Arabic, English, French, German, Italian, Spanish. Uh, why those languages? French, German, Italian, Spanish are uh, among the most widely spoken languages in the world. I know they have small native populations of speakers on a relative scale, relative to Mandarin, for example, but they're large economies. There are people, uh, second level people who, who learn these languages, L2 people as, as an L2. Um, and so I was interested in them, uh, Arabic, Turkish, and Russian. Russian does qualify. Actually, they all qualify uh, in that category. But those languages, because those are where my uh, co-ethnic Circassians live in the world. And I thought, you know, there are bound to be cultural differences across these different um, regions, or at least languages, these cultures. Let me scan across everything and see, um, see what I can find. So... Having purchased about a dozen of these books and having spent several years extracting, writing out everything in English because I didn't care so much about the other um, languages at this point, um, I came up with about 8,000 phrases and uh, wrote them all or typed them all into Excel. And I, I'm, not a formal, I'm not a formally trained linguist. I have several who advise me in my nonprofit efforts and they're always amazed that I use Excel to find patterns for prefixes and suffixes and affixes and uh, parts of speech and, and grammatical tenses and verb, I'm sorry, verb tenses and uh, grammatical cases. So I, I dumped all the stuff into Excel and I started looking for patterns. And what I realized is this wasn't really 8,000 phrases. Um, Peace be upon you, which is the English translation of Salaam Alaikum, which is Arabic, is hello, right? Um, <clears throat> how are you doing is kind of hello. How's it going? How's it hanging? What's up? I mean, these are all vernacular variations of a very common uh, phrase, which is hello, how are you doing? Or hi, right? All three of which are unique phrases, but the variations of which you didn't really need to worry about. The goal was not to speak perfectly. The goal, at least for me, and this is how guided immersion evolved, 
The goal was be able to speak well enough, well enough to make yourself understood, well enough to set the person speaking with you at a level of ease such that they would modify their speech as nearly all native speakers do when interacting with non-native speakers. They do this subconsciously. It, we're, we're trained to do it with children who are native speakers. So the goal was not to speak perfectly. It was to speak good enough. Um, and I trolled through this phrase library and uh, distilled it down to about a thousand phrases. And then through trial and error, I built it back up to about 1,500 phrases, in, in part because, you know, certain, certain topological uh, content areas like um, asking for a prescription or um, having your car repaired. Those are quintessential phrase book, uh, tourist guide type of um, content pieces. But for daily life, which is what I really wanted to be able to dive into in speaking Circassian or, or any of the other languages I've learned or I'm attempting to learn since then, I decided that I wanted to learn how to say those things. So put all these things together. What did I do then? I, I realized that, I'm going to adjust this camera. I think it might be slipping a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what I realized then was that um, I didn't sure, I wasn't sure that I had full coverage of the, of the, of the vocabulary that, was necessary to be able to really speak to the level that I wanted to speak. Um, and by this time, by the way, I should mention that I uh, uh, was remarried to my current wife, uh, who's a native speaker of Circassian. And I found myself just in the kitchen uh, practicing with her and our small children. Again, a, a really interesting language lab to speak, uh, watch my wife learn English, have my wife watch me learn Circassian and then Russian, watch our children mix some of these languages and pick them up. An amazing little laboratory to test out a lot of my theories. Um, but I realized as we were cooking and I was uh, making spinach, I didn't know the word for spinach, right? And that's, for me, that's a common word. That's, I eat lots of, lots of spinach with my salad. So um, decided that I wanted to factor in high frequency words. So here's why I ran into a little, I ran into a similar level of difficulty as I did with this phrases. Um, if you go and buy any commercial uh, word frequency index, or you go and download one from, from Wikipedia or wherever it is that you may get these, there's always going to be some weird irregularities in them be, for, for at least two reasons. One is um, the content the source material from which these word indices are developed is one issue. Whether they're coming from newspapers or books or magazines or radio or television. Uh, and then what is the television it's coming from? Are they television shows? Are they novellas? Are they broadcasts of news? Then the other thing is, and this is what I learned very early on, there's a huge difference between a useful word and a high frequency word. So what do I mean by that? Um, looking at all these different word frequency indices, what I realized is that the word help is typically around word two to 300 in a lot of the languages that I looked at. When you're learning a language, the word help is probably one of the first words you want to learn. Can you help me? I need help. You know, things of that nature. So <clears throat> it was really a, a mix of high frequency words um, from these word lists, um, sight words that are taught to children, and then um, sight words that are taught to um, ESL, English as a second language learners, and then uh, people who are learning, you know, some of these other languages that I referenced before that I was looking at, just because there's lots of, um, lots of materials to, to learn German, to learn French, Italian, Russian, you know, these big language families that are out there, very commercial uh, language families. And um, really through a combination of some empirical collected collection of data and my own desires, I put together what I consider to be a, a pretty good, pretty decent, um, what I call universal, um, useful word list, right? Why do I say it's universal? Because maybe the word God is not um, number 17 on the list as it might be for Arabic because God is used in a lot of common phrases. Um, it is on the list. But other words that are more universal like hungry or mother or father, days of the week, months of the year, I, I thought it was odd that in several of the word frequency indices that I, commercial ones published by reputable academic um, 
uh, publishing houses, 10 out of the 12 months were listed. Now I can understand statistically within the sample set that they drew upon, that would make sense. But again, that just goes to delineate the difference between a high frequency word and a, a useful word. So I'd put all these things together into uh, a list of 1500 uh, phrases. And I thought, this is great. Um, I'm now going to memorize these. And that was such a horrible mistake. That was uh, such a miserable exercise um, for a couple of reasons. One is there's a, you know, I've always said there's a huge difference between learning and studying, right? So w when you're actively studying a language, it almost brings in this level of stress that, um, that makes it hard to really internalize what it is that you're learning. So for example, you know, in, in circassian, I'll, I'll use an example. Um, maybe there's a phrase of, uh, what are you doing right now? What are you doing? What did you, what did you do today? Right? Off the top of my head, I can say these things. I can meet a fellow circassian. How are you? What did you do today? It's not a problem because it feels natural and organic and there's no stress in, you know, am I saying psha or psa? These are two sounds in circassian and they actually are two words as well. Um, it's not forced, it's not rehearsed, it just flows organically, it flows logically. There's no stress, there's no stress. That's the best way that I can, uh, I can say it. So um, what I found is that uh, memorizing them through flashcards, through space repetition, it didn't quite work. But what I also found was that when I made a conscious effort to try to say these phrases uh, a couple times during the day to my wife, to my kids, to my to my parents, to other members of my community, they just kind of set in. They they set in and it became like second nature. It, it became it felt to me like walking as an adult as opposed to walking as a toddler, right? Who's kind of learning this behavior. It's not quite first. Um, uh, first nature and second nature. So I thought, hey, this is great. You know, what did I discover? I discovered that if I give somebody, and I, I tested this on my children, uh, older and younger. I tested this on other fellow Circassians who wanted to learn Circassian. Um, and I, what I learned was that when you give people things they want to say, phrases so they can communicate with people in their community, people they might meet who speak the language, when you arm them, with enough vocabulary that they can then mix and match. Um, and when you take away the stress of, uh, you know, memorizing these things or, or worrying about the pronunciation or the grammar or the complexity of the grammar, when you, when you, when you accomplish all of that, people just organically begin to speak. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is really cool. You know, what can I do? What can I do to improve this, to improve this? So, um, like many people who have attempted to learn languages and who speaks a few languages, um, there's a couple of products out there that I like, that I enjoy, uh, that have done well for me personally. And uh, believe it or not, uh, the Pimsleur method was something that worked really well for me to begin my journey in learning Russian. And what I liked about the, 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 the Pimsleur method was they kept um, reintroducing these, these new words, these new concepts, these new phrases, these new, these new phenomes to you at regular intervals. And so it wasn't really about um, memorizing them per se. It was about keeping it fresh in your mind. And I thought, this is pretty interesting. At this point, I was probably eight years into what is now my 10 year journey to kind of figure out and learn, you know, how do I learn this language? How can I teach other people this language? And then ultimately, as I'm doing today, how can I apply what I've learned for people to learn a variety of different languages? So um, I thought, this is this is cool. What did I learn? Um, things that people want to learn, given to them in dead simple, uh, in my case, translations. You know, how are you? How are you? How are you? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? I'm going back and forth with Circassian, obviously. Um, keep just reminding people what these very short phrases mean. And eventually they're just going to spit it out and start speaking organically and do so in a low stress environment. So around this time, 
I came across a uh, the publications of Stephen Krashen and his uh, comprehensible input hypothesis, and I was pleasantly shocked. I, I, I thought, wow, here's a, a learned scholar who's well-respected, well-cited, and he's written a whole book that is basically my experience. You know, um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of, of his entire hypothesis. There's boatloads of videos on YouTube uh, that document what it is. But <laughs> long story short, when you give people lots of content that they can understand, and it doesn't have to be audio the way that I do it, it can be visual, right? There's a lot of different ways it can be done. When you give people lots of content that they understand, when it's relevant and interesting to them, when you arm them with enough vocabulary that they can begin to express themselves, and when you remove stress and you avoid the temptation to learn and memorize as opposed to just organically absorb, um, people will start outputting. People will just organically start speaking. And this is remarkable. It's remarkable that this thing that I just kind of stumbled upon um, is validated by research that is, in some cases, older than me. You know, so that that was kind of a cool and fun and interesting thing. The other kind of cool thing that uh, I realized in, in developing my, you know, what I call guided immersion, and again, this really grows out of. Um, um, my efforts to learn and to teach circassian circassian is uh you know, everybody will say a, a language is difficult if you don't speak it's difficult um i've never really liked the word difficult i i think there's things that take time and there's things you make time for so learning learning a new alphabet with uh, a very complex phenome structure it takes time is it hard i don't like using the word hard but it does take time and a lot of people don't have the time or they, they want to get that benefit as quickly and as efficiently. Efficiency and effectiveness. That's what I, the word I was looking for before. They want to get there as efficiently as possible. And therefore, the method must be as effective as possible. That was what I was struggling to remember before. So I avoided, again, I, I, avoid, I, I threw grammar out of the equation. Um, and I relied on an audio method. It basically, it's a glorified listen and repeat. That's what some people might say. I, there's a little bit more science and in, in thinking into it when it comes to what I've developed, and I'll explain it in just a moment. So um, it took me a year to learn the Circassian alphabet because it's 56 letters. It's, um, in some cases, a tonal-based alphabet. And some of the tones are very, very close and they're very, very difficult for a non-native speaker to pick up. Um, just to give you an example, we have the letters sh, s, and s, right? Sh, s, s. These are three different letters um, that look very similar, one of which is actually two characters long. Developing an ear for that and then writing them and being able to recall them fluidly and naturally, that, that, it took me forever. Um, another example, right? In, in our language, we have the, in Circassian, we have, uh, these are six, six or eight sounds. Let me, let me go through them. There's k, there's tz, there's qu, there's k, there's k, there's qu. Yeah, six different uh, sounds. They all have a k in them. Most of them are multiple characters long. In fact, q is actually uh, five, four characters long. So being able to hear all of those different sounds and then being able to map them to letters, and in some cases, letters that are multiple characters, that are multiple Cyrillic characters long, um, very time consuming. So I developed an audio method, um, but I ran into some difficulties. What were those difficulties? I realized that developing something that like 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 what Pimsleur has developed, which is a great great program by the way, a little short, a little limited in terms of the scope, but it's a great program nonetheless. Would be beyond my capabilities in terms of resources, and the reason for that is it's not just a matter of phrases or even dialogues; it's all the editorial control that goes into taking a long sentence or a long word, breaking it into its um, syllables using back chaining. Uh, you know, I use back chaining in, in my in my course as well. But using back chaining, all the editorial control that goes into 
designing the course, getting a native speaker to speak the course, then having an editor, a sound editor who speaks that language and is familiar with the te teaching method to then break apart all the syllables and do all the back chaining and all the repetition. It, it just, it's, it was, I tried it. Um, in fact, if you look around on YouTube on my personal channel, you'll probably come across a couple of old um, efforts. And I found that producing one minute of finished audio took about an hour of input, about an hour of effort from start to finish. So I gave up on that. Um, however, in developing my phrases, I got up to version 12 of the method, the, the, the content that is now at the core of uh, my phraseology series. I got up to version 12. Why? How? Um, well, a couple reasons. You know, going through all these phrases and learning in Russian, for example, there's Zemechetina, uh, right, which is fantastic, and Atlichna, which is excellent. You know, if you know those two, I don't need outstanding and audacious and, you know, all these sort of superlative um, exclamatory adjectives I don't or, or adverbs or particles in some cases. I don't need all of that um, to say something is big, large, huge, enormous, gigantic. Yeah, I don't need all of that richness because, again, I'm not looking to speak perfectly. I'm looking to be understood uh, and to understand others. And again, if you're speaking to uh, a native speaker, they're going to mod they're going to naturally, even subconsciously modify their speech and use simpler language. So I didn't need all these different um, I didn't need that, that level of vocabulary. But the other thing that I realized is <clears throat> in developing what is now the algorithm behind my methodology, um, I had a hard time, you know, and by the way, just as a side note, once I really believed that I had something that would work for circassian, I rebuilt the whole thing from scratch in Russian and applied it to myself in order to learn Russian. And my, my Russian is rusty. It's not rusty. My, my Russian is not strong, um, but I can speak well enough that my wife can understand me. She's a native Russian speaker. I can speak well enough that when I go uh, to Russia, I can get through the airport. And, you know, this is me just kind of farting around and experimenting on myself, not really being uh, serious and concerted about learning Russian to the extent that I've learned Circassian. Although that is changing, I am getting a little bit more serious about it. Um, but what I realized was that if the phrases were, were too long, um, I would have a hard time keeping them into short-term memory in the time it took to pause and attempt to recall. So um, did a lot of research on short-term memory and you know there's nothing shocking what I'm about to say. Uh, most people have a hard time storing more than seven things within their, their short-term memories. Um, and that this is actually why phone numbers are structured the way they are in many countries. In the United States, you know, my phone number is, everybody's phone number is an area code, a local exchange, and then a four-digit number. So if you live in an area where you kind of grew up and 